This is Justin with Style of Substance. In Akira Kurosawa's 1950 film La Shaman, a woodcutter, a priest, and a commoner discuss the murder of a man whose body was found in the woods by the woodcutter. Witnesses and suspects testify in court. The woodcutter, a bandit, and the man's wife share their accounts on what occurred in the woods. While the truth may exist somewhere within these stories, each individual one contradicts the other. Ultimately, the truth is indeterminable. But why would people lie? An answer isn't overtly provided in the text, but a character does give his thoughts as to why men lie. It is briefly suggested that a man's deceit comes from their own fragility. Men feel they must lie or adjust the truth to make themselves out to be more traditionally masculine. Men must be strong, powerful, cunning, and so on and so forth. Thus, the stories they tell will reflect that. In reality, men may very well be weak and cowardly. Different men latch onto specific aspects of masculinity. The husband, commonly referred to by critics as a samurai, values his code of honor, while the bandit values his might and power. To prove his sense of masculinity, the bandit's story focuses on the power he can enforce on others. <laughs> to him, might makes right. This is why the bandit makes himself out to be more manly than a samurai. He is able to defeat and capture him, demonstrating his power. He then follows the wife, whom he says is both childlike, <laughs> but also fierce. He chases her and knocks her down, leading her to cry. He gets on top of her body and sexually assaults her. His story plays out like a power fantasy, with the woman being something of an untamable animal, so that he, in turn, can prove his manliness by taming the untamable. This is why she eventually drops the knife and gives in, becoming seduced by his charm. This happens, of course, because this is his story. <laughs> After getting his way with her, the woman instructs him to kill her husband, as she must only belong to one man. <laughs> Interestingly, even in other characters' accounts of the story, one could interpret the woman as having ulterior motives behind her actions. Who and what the characters view as truth heavily revolves around their perceptions of gender roles in society, with the wife of the late samurai existing as a crucial figure in each account of the event. When the woman testifies, she is in tears, and acts completely different from how the bandit described her. This could very well be an act. She could be exploiting her socially perceived weakness in order to gain the best possible outcome of the situation. Alternatively, she could very well be telling the truth, and this is how she ordinarily behaves under pressure. It's up to the viewer to determine the truth. <laughs> Naturally, the woman's story puts her in a relatively favorable position for the judges. She is a victim of rape at the hands of the bandit, and is also subjected to judgment by her husband, who stares at her in silence, until her shame brings her over the edge. <laughs> She asked her husband to kill her so that she would be brought to peace. <laughs> 
The woman's story may be believable, but is scrutinized like the bandits. The film takes on a more supernatural turn, as the men contact the ghost of the samurai through a female medium. Like the others, the ghost's story is revealed to be unreliable. In the ghost account, the bandit states he had only assaulted her out of love. This is indeed a trivialization of sexual abuse. He states that she fell for the bandit and instructed that her husband be killed. The husband's loathing for his wife becomes clear as he frames the bandit as a fellow man with honor who ultimately chooses the right thing. The bandit refuses her directions and asks the husband to decide her fate. She escapes his clutches and runs away. A few hours later, the bandit frees the samurai, but the samurai commits suicide, as he has never felt more dishonored as a man than he does at this point. It is later revealed that the woodcutter has withheld information and had actually witnessed much more than he originally stated. While key information is still missing, this story appears the most plausible, at least on the surface. However, it could be fabricated to put the men's minds to rest, formed through synthesizing the most likely aspects of the other stories. Considering the man stated he lied before, it does not necessarily mean he isn't lying now. He is a man after all, and men are weak. The woodcutter's story has more nuance than the others, as he allegedly was nothing more than a mere witness. According to his account, the bandit urges the weeping woman to agree to be his wife, and threatens her if she does not accept. <laughs> She encourages the two to fight to the death for her, as it is their place in society as men to decide who is really man enough for her. <laughs> Feeling disgusted by her, the samurai states she is not worth the fight. <laughs> And then tells her to kill herself. Here the woman is seen crying, but it is also clear that she uses her seemingly sensitive nature to her advantage. Her husband remarks that her acting won't work anymore. The bandit sympathizes with her and voices his thoughts on the differences between men and women. What is now generally regarded as sexist rhetoric is used here to counter another man's misogyny. In this instance, the woman benefits from the social roles that simultaneously oppress her gender. She then calls the men weak, as they are not showing themselves capable of proving their worth through a fight. Furthermore, it is stated that a woman loves a man who loves passionately. She 
She convinces them to fight with swords. To add a bit of Freudian reading, the sword is a phallic symbol, representative of the traditional man. Thus, the nature of the fight between the two men with swords defending their masculinity and right to the woman is telling. They are reluctant to engage at first, and they run away from one another after the first few sword clashes. There is much trembling and panting. The swords shake in their hands, and the fight itself is sloppy and awkward. There is little grace to it, unlike previous accounts. This highlights the weakness within the men who desperately attempt to prove their masculinity. After the bandit wins the fight, he stabs the other man. <laughs> then, like an unintelligent animal, the bandit chases after the woman. It was all for sex and power. It is through this rather unflattering depiction of men that we find the most potentially honest of the stories. The men feel they must lie to preserve their own image in this patriarchal society. But the truth remains unclear. The priest and the commoner don't entirely know who to believe, stating that the men are all dominated by their own selfish desires. The priest's faith in people is tested. As the pillars of truth crumble, the already damaged Lashamon gate begins to break, letting the rain pour inside. there still is a glimmer of hope. A baby is found in a basket, and the woodcutter agrees to raise the child, just as he has raised six others. Casting a positive light on fatherhood, an aspect of masculine social roles. The priest's faith in humanity is restored. The woodcutter walks away with the baby in his arms, and the sun shines once more. Special thanks to my patron, Yakov Janoy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing and sharing my work around. If you really enjoy what I do and want to be included in my credits, consider donating to my Patreon. I have plenty of projects on their way, so stay tuned. Bye-bye.